broadcasting live from Houston, from the space city to the world, you are watching Now Media Television. Welcome to Power CEOs, the truth behind the business. I'm Jen Godet, your host, entrepreneur, speaker, best-selling author, and investor. And we're here today because I believe that iron sharpens iron. And when we come together with what's working and maybe what isn't in business, then we can offer you the best of the best so that that sets you apart. Why? Because I believe that entrepreneurs and small business owners are the lifeblood of our communities. When we elevate ourselves, when we're able to impact more lives, the ripple effect is felt not only by ourselves and our teams and our clients, but also our families, our communities, and our world. I'm really excited because I have three amazing guests here with me today. They are all investors and entrepreneurs, so you're gonna hear a whole lot of uh, good, bad, and ugly today um, from some of my dear friends and fellow investors. Without further ado, I have first off, Mr. Craig T. Ingram, MedTech and Healthcare Senior Executive and Investor. Welcome to the show, Craig. Thank you, great to be here. So tell me, Craig, MedTech, <laughs> Healthcare, Investing, how did you know this was for you? Uh, well, back in uh, when I was in high school, my dad actually got diagnosed with uh, stage four esophageal cancer and I, learned that there was new technology that was coming out. We imported it from Germany. And so I started seeing all this medical technology being used on my own dad. And I saw where the physicians were like, you were supposed to be dead a long time ago. Well, we don't know what's going on. And so I saw that there was a um, innovation. And I just started at 19 years old. I went out, found uh, companies that would hire me as a 1099. And I started selling at 19 years old when I was a sophomore in college. Wow, that's one heck of a story. Yeah. And you're still here with us today. <laughs> yeah, 26 <laughs> years later. <laughs> That's, That's fantastic. Neat. Also joining us today in studio, we have Chris Sheffield. She is the president of WMC REIA and a fellow investor. Welcome to the studio, Chris. Thank you, Jen. Great to be here. It's so exciting to have you here. So tell me, how did you know that real estate and investing was for you? Well, I really didn't, to be honest, but I always loved real estate and um, I've always wanted to invest. And I lost my husband about 12 years ago and we were partners in a business, which we could talk about later because you never brand yourself with your husband. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, uh, and I had to switch careers and that's what happened. I got into real estate investing. And you haven't looked back. I haven't looked back. Fantastic. Last but certainly not least, we also have Mike Washburn of Exit Realty of the Carolinas. He is the CEO and also a fellow investor. Mike, welcome to the studio. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Oh, same question I posed to Chris. Uh, Glad to be here. Chris, what, what about real estate like really piqued your interest and, and got you started? You know, it, it, I was in sales right when I got out of college and, and I kept running into people and they kept saying, you need to get in real estate, you need to get in real estate. Then I went and started my first business right after that when I was 22 and uh, and we ran that until 1989 and, and people kept saying you need to get in real estate and uh, I sold that business in 1989 and the, the timing was perfect and somebody said you need to come to work for me and that's when I did and and I've loved it ever since but uh, fantastic well it's super exciting to have all of you here today <clears throat> let's get into the nitty-gritty so we all are entrepreneurs and investors. We know that there is a tremendous amount of risk that goes into investing mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship. And we all made that leap at some point in time. And my, I guess my question is, because a lot of our viewers are maybe have a side gig and they work a job or um, maybe they're thinking about starting a business or they're just stuck. When you decided that this is what you were gonna do, when you sold your first business and then went into real estate, for example, how did you know, like, how did you know this is what I'm going to do? How did it feel to make that jump? And then tell me, was it easy? How did it feel? It's, it's when, like anything, when you start something new, it's like, oh my God, what have I done? And I'll give you an idea on, on this. I, I had committed to go ahead and start working with this company. Well, Hurricane Hugo hit September 29th, I think it was, 1989 literally tore Charleston to shreds. It looked like an atom bomb had gone off. 
I mean, the roofs were in the streets and the buildings were all torn up, the windows were out. That's the week I started. And so. What a week. <laughs> what a week. Yeah, I mean, like in a building like this, the carpet was floating. Oh my goodness. The roof was gone. There was no electricity. And wow. people were carrying things out in soggy boxes and just putting it in their trunks of their cars and hauling it away. And I, I went into the commercial business, and that's what the state of the commercial buildings were. When I went to them, you know, they were torn off, the roofs were gone, the air conditioners didn't work, there were buckets catching the water, and um, that's, that's where I started. Okay. So I'm, it was push on, you know? <laughs> absolutely. So, so you started with all the adversity. Yeah. And you pressed on. And so I think that's a common uh, thread that comes up a lot on our show, and that's that things are tough. And sometimes when we start, we're really excited and we have all the energy. So I'm going to ask you, as you continued and your energy waned, because after a hurricane, I know I'm from New Orleans, so I've been through, yeah. I've been through it as well. It's not a quick thing. It's kind of like they're a long-term fix. It takes a long time to get all the supplies, everything you need, and the, right. the um, crews and stuff. So as you continue to trudge through that circumstance, how are you able to maintain your energy and, and keep showing up? Well, luckily then I was a lot younger than I am now. I was, like, <laughs> I was in my 20s. <laughs> but, but yeah, because it was, it was literally 24 hours a day back then in some cases, trying to get the buildings back together and getting the roofs back on. I mean, there were crews working like that, like they'd light up things and still keep working. But um, you just, it was one of those things you had to do it, you know? I mean, you had deadlines, you had to get them back in. And the interesting thing was after we were finished, everything looked so much better. I mean, it looked fantastic. It was like taking an old house and renovating it. And the whole city looked better. And uh, it was very interesting. And, and, and it was so much money came in from all the all the renovations that the, the economy in that in that town just boom that was Charles. That's awesome. And yeah. a, a lot of times we talk about disruption and disruption providing opportunity and and, and that's we, what it was. Yeah, and we a lot of times people choose to look at this, at things as a disaster or like let's use the pandemic as an example. Oh, this is a horrible situation, but entrepreneurs look at it differently. We look at it as oh, where is the opportunity? How can we make something better on the other side than what we started? And it sounds like you did that. That's fantastic. So I'm gonna pass that question off to Chris next, and I'm gonna say, Chris, when you decided that you were gonna go all in on what you're doing right now, how did that feel to make that jump? Um, and when the go, was it easy? Well, thank God I didn't do it without coaching because <laughs> um, I would have made some really big mistakes. So at, once I got coaching though, it felt like it felt like it was the perfect thing to do. I absolutely loved it. Um, made a lot of mistakes, which you know you do. But thank goodness I didn't lose a lot of money. Lost. Uh, well, I actually broke even on my first two projects. So, you know that's pretty good. From what I understand, about eighty percent of the people doing this lose money. Yeah, I believe so, it's seventy-seven percent of yeah. everybody who goes into the industry ends up losing money. So right. that's really fantastic. So I thought pretty good. But uh, I, I love it. I always have wanted to renovate homes. I love homes, and um, it's, it's a lot harder than I thought. And I get a lot of mansplaining <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> being a woman in the industry. And so uh, they, they're shocked when they see me walk up because we're in a small town. You know, they're not used to seeing uh, women entrepreneur investors, real estate investors. But, you know, Michael helps me a lot, thank goodness. That's fantastic, and I'm gonna follow up with a question that might be a little bit controversial because people don't like to say these things, but you said the mansplaining word. So mm -hmm. how challenging is it, because a lot of our viewers are actually female entrepreneurs, how challenging is it to be a female in a male-dominated field? Like, what are the unique challenges and how are you able to overcome that adversity? You know, it's funny, I've been in male-dominated fields for very, very long times, and I grew up with 10 brothers. So I, you know, I'm used to that. <laughs> so you grew up in a male-dominated <laughs> world. My whole world is like male-dominated. There's no issue there. But, <laughs> it, it is, you really have to, to challenge yourself and, and get and become very well-educated in what you're doing because you have to uh, look smarter and, and be more competent than, than the men are, right? Because you're a woman and they don't think that you know as much as you know. So, I mean, that's what I've done. I've always tried to learn as much as I can and um, treat people really well. 
I think that that's a key in any industry and, and no matter what you're doing is treat people well. And then I have one follow-up question as well. And that's when, when you're moving in those spaces, um, a lot of times people try to take advantage of women when they think that they don't know something. So was there an instance early on before you knew all the things that you know now where you actually were in a situation where somebody oversold you or, or pulled the wool over and you had to learn the hard way? Thank goodness, like I said, I, I had coaching and my first house, I bought it right. I didn't make a dime on it because someone said that they would renovate it for me and they took, they kept telling me reason after reason, they, their wife had cancer, there were so many excuses, they needed more money, more money, more money, and I gave it to them because I didn't know any better and um, he ran off with my money. Mm. Mm. And so, that, that happens a lot actually, so if you're out there and it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, a lot of times People give them any for the draw before they see any materials or anything else. It's very important that we actually see some progress before we cut that check. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I've learned the hard way too, so mm -hmm. I, I wanted to point that out because one of the points of the show is we have a lot of people who are scared to get started because they don't know or they may be you know, a female in a male-dominated field or they may have something that they feel is an adversity. And what I'm hearing, what I heard from Mike and what I heard from you so far, and I'm sure I'm about to hear it from Craig as well, is it's continue to go on, pick yourself up, get coaching, get mentoring, figure out what you need to do, and keep it moving, and that's the key to success. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Craig, I know you've got something to add to this conversation. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, there's parts of entrepreneurship that are simple. There's parts to corporate America that are simple, but they're never easy, right? Just because something's simple doesn't mean it's easy. And, you know, in the medical technology world, in the healthcare world, there's such a dynamic that is involved because you're dealing with physicians, you're dealing with healthcare entities, you're dealing with insurance, you're dealing with patients, you're dealing with so many factors. It's a complicated business because patient care is the focus, but yet you still have to make a profit, right? And you still, it still costs money to do stage one, stage two, stage three trials, depending on the technology, whether it's pharmaceutical, whether it's medical technology, whether it is innovation of a medical device, whatever the case may be. Um, there's a lot of things that are simple, but they're never easy. And there's just challenge after challenge after challenge. And again, whether you're in corporate America like I am, or you've been an entrepreneur like I am, or like I have been, um, it's all about running for the price. It's, it's not only starting well, because most people can start something very well. They don't finish well. They don't have the tenacity to finish strong. So finish strong, tenacity, mm -hmm. consistence, pick yourself up. Yeah. And I'm hearing the same themes. If you're not writing these things down, you're <laughs> yeah. missing out here. Um, and so as we got dive deeper in that, Craig, I'm gonna ask a follow-up question to you. You're dealing with corporate and you do some entrepreneurial things um, as well yeah. and investing. And so we do have many viewers who are in that road where maybe they side gig or maybe they invest in the side um, to work on their financial security outside of their J-O-B. How are you able to set the boundaries between the two so that you can be all that you need to be in your corporate position and, and lead your teams because you're a senior executive and, yeah. and do all the things from that executive leadership position and also have time for the investing and then your family on top of that? Yeah, well, at the end of the day, when you have uh, a senior level corporate job like I have had, um, you have to be 100% dedicated to that job with the specific hours that not only are they paying you and that you've committed to because your word needs to be your bond. Your word needs to be better and more effective than a written contract, right? If the written contract goes awry, you've got your word to back you up. And that is what is rare in, in, in our society today. That's called integrity. 100%. 100%, right? Yeah. And so when I'm on my job, I am on. And then when it hits 5.30 or 6 at night or if I'm on the weekends and I'm doing something, that's when I do my coaching to sales reps. That's when I do, uh, you know, maybe a two hour commercialization plan, putting that together for a, a startup company or a, or a guy who's a, uh, an inventor that wants to know how to, how to get to a, a, an FDA stage one trial or something like that. And so um, you just have to time block. 
and you just have to give your regular job 100%. You can't give more than 100%. It, nothing drives me more bonkers than when somebody says, give 150%. You can't. You've got 100%. That's it, right? So you do it well, you start well, you finish well, and then when you're done and you've finished your work for the day or the week or the month, then you can do other situations that will not compete with your uh, existing corporate job, but you can actually add value and invest in all that stuff as well. Yeah, and I know you have a family and you're very active with your family as well. And so what I'm hearing actually, integrity is part of it. Do what you say you're gonna do, when you say, where you say you're gonna do it, but also boundaries and full presence. 100%. I heard be full present, whatever you're doing. And so do you ever have a situation, because this comes up a lot in, in my, I'm a coach as well, and I coach a lot of people on business and life, becoming yeah. the executive of their business and their life, yeah. and they have a hard time with this. How are you able to be fully present with your family with when you're in that space and the phone rings on your entrepreneurial gig while you're doing family things? How are you able to balance that and navigate those waters? To answer that question bluntly, um, I, depending on the timing of what I'm doing at the time, I'll either answer that call or what I'll do is I'll let it go to voicemail. Most of the time, I'll answer the call and if I'm doing something important, I will take their phone number or their email and I will get back to them at a specific time because uh, I, I want people to return my phone calls. I want everybody deserves um, their, their call, their email answered, right? And I think that's what separated me over the years from everybody else. I don't ghost people. I pick up the phone, I answer it. If it's not the right time, what I do is I call them back at a separate time that, that is appropriate. Fantastic. Also, very, very good on the boundaries. Do what you say you're going to do. Absolutely. And, and just to kind of add to that, something that I've found very effective is I train my people. Or I have a message that says, hey, look, I'll get back with you within 24 hours or the next business day. Right? And so that way people know that I'm going to get back. But I do it. I get back with them the next <coughs> business day because that's integrity. Be where you say you're going to be when you say you're going to be with full presence. And so this is an amazing conversation. We're about to go to break. If you haven't been taking notes or if you need to grab your, your notebook, go ahead and do so. We'll see you in just a few moments.